Straight from the Uptown Construction Company, my name is Eric, and I'm here with construction worker Michael Kester. Hey, fuck you. I, uh, I'm not a part of whatever's going on outside. I don't know what's happening there. You know, we always complain about these things, yeah. and no one can hear them right. on the show. You and I can hear them. Well, well and we've but, seen uh, what they're doing now. They're eating. They're literally eating the road. Yeah. is what's going on. Yeah. Not the men. The robots are eating the road. There's just going to be a lot of outside noise, and if it bothers you, I guess you don't listen in headphones. Well, that's why we have chapters. That. Yeah, skip the uh, skip the noise. I'll chapter the noise out. Yeah. Uh, it'll be chapters one, two, and three. And uh, if you skip to where there's no more show, then uh, the noise will be gone. Silence. There'll be dead silence. What are we... I'm uh, sorry. It's too early to talk about dead silence. What are we going to attempt to talk about on this show? Uh, we're going to talk about Orphan uh -huh. and Insidious. Orphan in a, and Insidious. Yeah, we're going to do a Piano Moms double feature. I don't think Piano Moms is the... It's a solid basis for... We go through a lot when I we're putting these two movies together. I don't remember particularly what the idea was this week. I don't think it was Piano Moms. It was Piano Moms. I just didn't want to tell you. Are you sure? Yes. Something about children but or... Like with a Piano Mom twist. Uh, why don't we talk about Orphan first? There's a, there's a scene that's, that this movie starts with. And there's a lot of these on a list of over 9,000 things that I enjoy about this film. Uh, one is just all the art direction stuff. And the way they use that to, you know, kind of further their cause throughout the... I, so we start with the hospital scene. Mm -hmm. The dream sequence, which is... Uh, I've learned to love dream sequences over the years because that's where you do all of the artsy nonsense in your right. movie. So we get this fucking hospital scene. It's just blood dripping out of the wheelchair. And then there's the, the just glorious overhead shot of that. They're painting a white line down yeah. the center of the They're hallway. painting a red line. Thank you. Yeah. They're painting a red line on the, in um, the white hallway. There you go. Yeah, it's gorgeous. There's another one, too. Just I Really, they are littered yeah. throughout the whole movie. But the other one that springs to mind from uh, pretty early in the film is that shot that rests on the door, you know, where she sure. locks it. So you see the reflection of uh, Kate walking away yeah. and then walking back. Just the various things they're trying to accomplish in that shot. They don't have to pan to her walking away. They can show it in the doorknob, sure. but they also show the, the lock turning. Right. So you see that too. It just conveys a lot of things that you need to express in a scene without moving your camera anywhere using kind of unconventional mechanics. Uh -huh. The thing that I always remember specifically about this film, other than just Esther and just kind of her persona, yeah, right. is that scene where the bully bitch at school tries to take off her neck ribbon. Oh, yeah. And the camera starts shaking, sure, but Esther's sure. face remains in focus while yeah. everything's moving around. That I always remember as one of the definitive looks for the film, yeah, even though they yeah. never really do much like that. Yeah, you can get that a couple different ways. I mean, you can still get that in uh, in a practical manner if you were to... It's kind of like the snore camera. Yeah, effect. that's what I, it kind of looks like. If you attach the camera to your actor, then, you know, however they move, they're going to remain somewhat stable. Uh, depending on how well that, that camera's attached, maybe really stable in the shot. You can do that in post, too, by correcting for movement in your uh -huh. camera. So it's something that's built into, uh, I think the first place it was built in was iMovie and then Final Cut got it. I mean, it's existed a long time before that, but now it's just sort of a default plug-in for consumer grade. Yeah. You know, I shot this with my phone and it looks really shaky. Can you stabilize it for me? It's just an automated sort of thing you can do. And a lot of times if you have a really shaky camera, it's going to make it look like a snore cam. And that kind of, it, it has that digital look to it where I don't feel like the camera was right. attached to her. I yeah. feel like it's kind of done in post. But yeah, that's a, that's a hard scene because showing a, a child freak out in a movie, I kind of feel like it's, it's when I'm at the grocery store and someone's tantrum. kids freaking out. I it's, don't want to be around that. It's not a tantrum. Yeah. And outside of where the camera is, yeah. from, a, from a wide shot, yeah. it becomes a tantrum. 
Yeah, I mean, it feels like a panic attack yeah, to me. Yeah, exactly. Well, I and, don't want to see a kid pitch a fit in a movie. It makes me feel right. awkward. Well, and that's that's kind of what's amazing about this film is none of the children are shot as children. Yeah, right. Um, even when Esther's freaking out in the bathroom stall, it's such sure. close quarters and it's all indoors and there's no... It doesn't look like a tantrum. Nobody turns to look at her to... Right, yeah. To, to tell the mom to hush her up or whatever. Right, right. Every all the kids are are just characters. They're just characters and players in the story. They treat it again. It it feels like a panic attack. Yep. It's like an adult actor sitting in there, uh, just having anxiety. Not for a moment. Do not to say that uh, children flipping out shouldn't be portrayed in film or anything. Right. I just I can make that personal distinction because when I see that in a movie, it's kind of everybody has their thing. Yeah. You know, they don't like to see uh, fingernails fall off or something. Sure. You know what I mean? Or ankles sliced. For me, it's children being loud and noisy. Uh-huh. Get, get that away from me. Yeah. And the fact that I don't have that internal reaction to Esther is I I think that's uh, one of the tells that they did this correctly, mm-hmm. that they're separating that from a child tantrum, that this is something different they're doing. I don't want to totally get into S3 yet. I want to talk about um, Kate a little bit. Okay. About uh, Vera Farmiga's yeah. character. We saw her in... Um, Dummy. I keep, yeah, I keep forgetting the name of that. Dummy. And uh, we talked a, a little bit about other things she's done in there. This is a, a great role for her. And a lot of her recent roles have been a lot more... I don't want to say subdued because... She's having just as many freakouts here. Mm-hmm. But she used to be a really wild... She portrayed a lot of wild characters. Um, a lot of people who were tattooed or alternative or had mental disorders. Yeah. Or, she's the, the pillar of stability in this movie. Yeah. Or attempts to be. She's a, a tough mom. She loves her kids. She uh, Obviously, she's had problems in her own life. But when you see her you know, uh, with either of her kids, even with Esther, you have, um, when she first picks up her daughter from school, great example of this, you have a very loving relationship. Her daughter runs to her arms. There's that kind of warm embrace, sure. really excited to see each other. You feel a lot of love there, yeah. but it doesn't feel like the, um, typical kind of Disney movie. Right. Um, it's not a cartoon. She also yells at her daughter yeah. like minutes later. Yeah, because she's, what, beating the wall with a basketball while she's being a piano mom. Right, <laughs> right. She, Yeah, she's being interrupted in her, uh, in her piano studies. Mm-hmm. So she goes out and she has a very real conversation with her daughter. She says, hey, shut the fuck up. I'm trying to play piano in here. And, you know, her daughter doesn't totally lose it, but... It's just this brief moment, and I feel like the only purpose of it is to show the kind of relationship they have. Sure. To go, you know what, they can be very real with each other. It's not all, you know, fuzzy bunnies and yeah. rainbows. Yeah, well, and I think another big angle is that that's the first moment that you see the crack in the Invincible Mom armor. That's true, um, yeah. Because with films, especially films with children, which is both of what we're covering today, mm-hmm. is you get this initial idea that, okay, the mom is the invincible one and the father is the flawed one who's going to have some weird problem with what's going on and he's he's the he's a little insecure, but she is the firm yeah. matriarch of the family. Yeah, she's so, the suspicious one as well right. and he is the, the skeptic right. of the uh, dubious whatever that's going sure. on. And so, I love, by the way, because I know I'm going to forget to say this, <laughs> That they don't attribute their problems to ghost cult. Right. Well, the other family, and Insidious, as we'll see, immediately goes, well, I guess it must be ghosts, right? Yeah, That's clearly the only explanation. Ghosts. Same fucking things happening in this movie, and they go, must be murderous daughter. Right. <laughs> it's, it's the only logical explanation. But he's dubious of even that because right. that's his role. Sure, and and she needs to she needs to start unraveling early, otherwise, to the point where she's smacking little girls drinking yeah. soda. Yeah, that wouldn't make any sense no. if she doesn't snap at her own children. So you're right. It it serves a couple purposes. Then it shows that she can fly off the handle, that she's doing everything she can to hold it together. But it also shows their bond. It shows that they have this real bond where they can talk to each other that way. Uh, or I guess she can talk to her daughter yeah. that way. Her daughter doesn't really have a lot of room to respond. Shut the fuck up, I'm playing basketball would be the appropriate response to that. <laughs> we start to get to that flaw in her character uh, when we get into the, the AA stuff and the alcoholism. Or I should say specifically not yeah, the, the not AA, AA stuff. stuff. The I quit drinking Man, stuff. She was so winning anyways, but that whole she turns around, I didn't go to AA, I just quit. 
Sounds like something we've talked about here on the show. Well, I think that that's the angle that separates this family from the family from Insidious. Go on. Is, is AA is your basic 12 step, give yourself over to God and then, you know, sure. God and then God and you're bad and God's good and God will make alcohol not be in your life. You know, surprisingly, Michael, the organization you're talking about does not uh, publicly publish their statistics huh. on recovery. Isn't Weird. that strange? Do they publish their statistics on operable higher powers? Yeah, it's uh, what three of the twelve steps I think yeah. have God in the in the thing. Not a religious or higher power it doesn't higher have power, to. It's not God. Doesn't have to be God, man. Little it could be God. a rock. It's just something outside yourself. It's a, yeah, it's a rock that's stronger than you. Oh, that well, rock isn't drinking. Stupid idea. Let that rock be your rock. I think there's one study that's. Uh, that's been dug up on AA and and kind of made public. It was the one they talked about in Penn and Teller's bullshit, yeah. where the uh, the rate of recovery of staying sober over a prolonged you know six months or whatever is no different than people who quit cold turkey. Yeah. So this is just another method. AA works for some people. This method also might have worked for them. Works for Kate. Yeah, we can basically call it just generally quitting, knocking it the fuck off. I think. So it's something she fights and mm -hmm. we see her have to fight it. We see her go by the wine store. I love that interaction. Uh, I'm having guess over for dinner. Yeah. Guy does not care yeah. at all. Does he not works care. works at a liquor slightest. store. Buy everything. It's kind of like um, last year we were talking all the time about the, I think it was the scene in the blob and again in Amazon Women on the Moon buying the condoms. Yeah. Uh, I'm just buying these for a for, doctor does not give a shit. Yep. Pharmacist does not care at all doctor there's a doctor that works at target i'm gonna call that person a doctor <laughs> sorry all about the target today so getting back to the actual concept of the movie and mm. the basic brilliance in one thread is that this family adopts a young girl right and she is brilliant and manipulative and sneaky and basically it's like evil home alone okay um, <laughs> think if kevin McAllister were trying to just kill his family all right. That's what this is about. It's about this girl who's torturing this family and is two steps ahead of them the entire time. She does horrible, horrible things. Yeah, she does. Uh, none of which involve the bathroom mirror. Well, they go to this house. I, their house is probably the nicest fucking house yeah. of all time. It's, uh, man, if I didn't have this craving for, you know, skyscraper penthouse... I would move into a house like this. It's, uh, it's really gorgeous. It's a huge place, and it's gorgeous. And uh, inside the dream house, of course, there is the bathroom mirror, which is the only flaw of the house. Yeah. It desperately needs some WD-40. I think <laughs> it's the, some kind of oil to... Why does it make that sound? Why? I don't know. It's, it's terror squeaks. I was arriving at a point with the mirror. I'm not just actually picking apart what I think is the only flaw to a, a beautiful house. But it's that scene, man. It's yeah. that Titanic 2 scene. The Revenge of the Titanic. Don't call it Titanic 2. Oh, sorry. Revenge of the Titanic is the film in question. And uh, yeah, <laughs> Where the mirror where, closes and you see the Titanic in the background. You see the, the Titanic background. looming in the background. You right. see the villain has been waiting in the, the bathtub okay. for you so, to close the medicine So we're cabinet. talking about hamster style here, yeah. right? Which is what you always get in these bathroom scenes. Close the mirror. Nothing's there. Close the mirror. Horrible monster. Something awful is Something there. Something with a goofy red face. Yeah, and, you know, there's a little bit of a payoff to this, because the second time, there's a fake out. Yeah. So you anticipate that there's going to be a third time where we see Esther, and she's coming after Kate. And you have to try to figure out how she gets that tall. Yeah, <laughs> how does she get... Well, they'll pitch it down a yeah. little bit. But they're doing the thing where they have the camera behind sure. her, and it's a little shaky for no reason. Yeah. And the reason is because it's going to be shaky later when it actually wants to make right. you feel... The point I'm arriving at here is there's no, the yeah. hamster style is not paid off. Yeah, it's just... Any just, further than beyond Kate's husband. That's just, it goes on to define the fact that this film is going to break rules and it's going to defy some of the conventions. I mean, by the end of the film, it's still doing things that were making your jaw drop. Yeah, that's um, true. If I may be completely honest and just go ahead and divulge the scene we're talking about, I forgot that she actually gets away with killing the son. Yeah. I've seen the movie about five times. Sure. I saw it in the theater. I've seen it as many times as, I mean, probably yeah. anybody. There's a... Uh... And she God. kills the son. Yep. And I always am surprised that he dies. There's a moment of denial afterwards. Well, you, you can't think, kill well, the kid in the even movie. They, you see the doctors come in and you think crash card and double yeah. flawed right. plan, but right. he's fucking dead. You kill the kid from shorts, he's gone. 
Well, so sometimes there's payoffs. Sometimes there aren't. Sometimes uh, it defies expectation. It mixes it up. You know, you think about uh, something like hamster style. You still have things like the um, the ribbons. Yeah. The hamster ribbons, right? Uh-huh. So why has she got all these ribbons? Sure. Don't pay any attention to that. We'll sure. address that later. You know they're coming back to it. But you also knew they were coming back to the mirror. Yeah. And you knew they're going to fake out the deaths and the accidents with the kids. But sometimes they don't. Yeah. Well, but you didn't expect them to come back to something like the paintings. Yeah, sure. Well, that's another thing. You know, you get the empty painting and then you have the reveal of the blacklight. And then there's an even further reveal later on. Those paintings, I mean, just fucking ingenious. So they have the scene where they're kind of showing, all right, here was the empty... Uh, it's not a house, it's the, the boarding school yeah, or whatever, the, uh, right? Sorn the Sorn Institute. Yeah, sure. And, you know, then they show the black light. And it's great because in that moment, she's also standing there admiring her own work. And the black light just makes her look fucking creepy. Mm-hmm. And up to this point, there's only, it's really just lighting and camera angle that will occasionally make her look creepy. For the most part, she looks, and this is one of the things I'm most impressed with, is that I love her from the moment I see her. Mm-hmm. I think she's great. And I know, you know from the fucking poster, that she's the scary yeah. girl that's going to kill everybody. Sure. But man, she's in the orphanage, and she is charming she's as She's humming fuck. and nicely she's great. dressed, painting. She's got... She's got great paintings going yeah, on. Eloquent stories about why she's an artist. I mean, yeah. it's almost as if she's a mature adult. Yeah, <laughs> almost. And then, you know, you have things like the lighting that make her a little creepy. You have these little moments, but you forget about them so quickly. And that's one of the great things the movie does is it reveals to you that she's sinister. Mm -hmm. And then she goes back to being a nice, sweet girl and you learn to love her again. You're totally fine with her until the next time it happens. And then towards the end, you get the big reveal with the, uh, the paintings, which is this giant wall she's put up, this huge collection of uh, kind of a blacklight mural and uh, two different paintings of her, I guess, foster parents, right? Sort of, although yeah. being 30 later makes that kind of weird. Um, her foster parents fucking. And it, you know, it calls back to that earlier scene. The movie does not shy away from the, you know, the, I guess, the implications of the adult relationships. Right. You're thinking about the weird sexual themes. You have the, um, the penthouse or Playboy or whatever that the kids are looking at earlier. Um, you know, just to make sure we can get some nudity in sure. this film besides the drawings. It's a, it's a great theme to try and weave into a story about, you know, youth and innocence and children when you're betraying that too. When you're saying, well, it's not a child, it's someone sure. who's actually older. Suddenly all of these adult themes have a kind of a different light to them. Right. Well, and so do the, so do the themes of youth in the film, because when the film is going and it's walking the lines that it's taking and beating nuns with hammers and right. what have you, yeah, you have what is the eldest sibling telling her younger siblings what to do and being the bully older sister, yeah, right? right? That's something that we've seen time and time again, but she's so good at it. Right. And then at the end of the film, you realize she's an adult yeah. and you realize that she's manipulating right. these children and how easy it is to just get kids to do the things that adults would never fucking do. Sure. Think about that. If if somebody came up to you and was going to ha- have you help them kill a nun because they were going <laughs> right. to tell, yeah. you would fucking call the cops. You'd <laughs> right. walk the other way. You would call right. the police, citizens arrest, whatever the fuck. Sure, sure. You <laughs> wouldn't help them kill a nun. No. But if you're four... And your older sister who knows better and right. doesn't want to get taken away. Right. I mean, you just need to know how to play a kid. Well, and beyond even, you know, an adult telling you that as a child, this is uh, it's almost one of your peers. Yeah. yeah. And so she's coerced probably even easier than had her mother told her that was sure. the right thing to do. But her mother does come into question, too. You know, that's right. a, another great dynamic here is that they make Kate look fucking insane later. And they do such a great job. And they also attribute it to the alcoholism, the sure. uh, the backwards car. Sure, yeah, all the pieces are in play. Oh my god, yeah, it's it's Esther and her her fucking perfect planning, right? She's um, I love everything about this character. Yeah. I really do. She's got this. Uh, she masks it a little bit in the beginning as her mom tells her, "Well, you don't want to stand out or whatever," mm-hmm. and she says, "I thought it was okay to be different." 
And I think everybody watching goes, oh, she's right. Yeah. Oh, fuck you, Kate. Esther's right. Well, even Kate goes, oh, yeah. she's right. Fuck yeah. you, Kate. Yeah, absolutely. And so here we have this great moral principle that's being thrown sure. out there. It's okay to be different. Right on. And she uses that to mask the fact that she's 30, posing as a child. Sure. So she can wear all these, you know, child dresses and the ribbons and stuff and get away with that. And then she's, I, I mean, this actor is awesome. Yeah. Just the... Fucking fantastic. You know, part of it is the charm of how that character is created. It's the Russian accent sure. and the, you know, the past and she's an orphan and whatever. But the maturity for her age makes... I mean, that's something that's been done. We've yeah, seen that a lot. Sure. We talked about that in Christina Ricci's character in The Addams Family. Yeah. Um, we've yeah, seen that in similar. a lot of our, our favorite, you know, child roles is, oh, they're more mature than they're supposed to be for their age. Well, and I think a lot of that comes with delivery, mm -hmm. um, specifically uh, the scene where Kate finds out Esther can play piano. Yeah, right. And she says something like, it must suck to have a son who's not interested in a daughter who yeah, can't hear. Great. I want to go play. Yeah, and just walks off, yeah. <laughs> right? Well, Meanwhile, Kate stands there absolutely unaware of how to Like respond. she's been punched yeah. in the gut. Right. That's how I felt yeah. after that. The, uh, it's an evolution of that concept, really. It's not just, oh, a, a kid who's mature for their age sure. and don't we love that. And maybe that's why I love it even more is because it is, you know, a, a step even further in that direction. It allows scenes like that where they can spar like adults would. Um, a lot of what we liked about, you know, let the right one in was sort of the same way where we had a lot of these, it's conversations as if a couple adults are talking, mm -hmm. you know, you just treat the, the children with that kind of authority and it allows you to make their characters more interesting. Right. You don't have to fall back on cliches like, you know, childhood innocence, something that's only touched on because we have a, a malicious, right. uh, appears to be child next to these other children. And by contrast, we examine that, but the movie doesn't have to set that up as a theme. Sure. It's just kind of built in that way. Even if the, uh, the part had been played by an adult, or we were just talking about, you know, an adult killer, mm -hmm. there are still moments. I mean, she's using youth to her advantage. We see that in the, in the oh, piano yeah. scene. She can just storm out like that and go play because she's a fucking kid. She and she doesn't know play. any better. But there's stuff like the Russian roulette scene. Yeah. I mean, the fact that she's asking for her sister to be an ally here and then immediately finds a gun and turns it on her. Yeah. Uh, fucking immediately and says, oh, do you want to play? It's alarming. But then they go right back to being friends or she goes right back to well, I think her sister's a little freaked out. Right. But but children are resilient. And that's why at the end of the film, these kids haven't come forward. Sure. They're not sure of the gravity of consequence. Well, and... yeah, she treats it like it was nothing. And so sure. her sister looks at her as a role model and goes, oh, this murderous weapon must not be a big deal. Right. Well, I mean, if you just think about it in, in the viewpoint of scales, the mm -hmm. little girl say she's four years old. Like, what percentage of your life by year have you had a gun pointed at you? Oh, 25% of my, 25% yeah, of my right. life. Okay, sure. So... That's it's not the most common thing, but it happens one out of every four years. Yeah. Well, and you don't know what that really means yeah. yet. You haven't seen all the other ways right. guns are used. Exactly. You know, they're bad and dangerous, but now someone else is showing you maybe probably so is a lake. Yeah. Yeah. So are knives. So is the outlet. Yeah. At this point, you'd be more afraid of the lake than the sure. gun. So she just treats it like it's nothing. The same way when she said fuck mm -hmm. as if uh, she knew the the. Um, the meaning of the word like they were talking about but it just came out like it was nothing and at the time you chalk that up to her character but this is one of the many many things where you can go back and go oh she's 30 of course she just uses the word she can do that in a way that a child probably couldn't even if they were planning to it's like she said it before because i'm sure she has it's the same thing with the piano wow she has all the skill at the piano once you get that reveal all of a sudden Oh, she's probably been playing piano for 20 years. Sure. You know, she's great at painting. Well, she's probably been at it quite a while. And so all of these magnificent skills she has, the way she talks, it all makes further sense in the context of, well, actually, she's been at all this stuff. And that twist isn't an easy swallow. No, it's for certainly not. A lesser film, that would have been the moment where I would have just finally You would have bailed. bailed. That would yeah, have been it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and it's it's the reason that I worry about showing the film to people because it's a tough swallow and it's yeah. a little goofy. But 
in the context of the film, by the time it comes up, that is so not what the movie's about. No, you don't even care. It's at that just point. an explanation. It, and that's what it is. It's an explanation, not a twist. And yeah. that's the strength of a good twist because by the time you get there, you're not surprised and you haven't figured it out. Yeah, a lot of times uh, I think I don't like a twist because it feels unnecessary. Sure. It's uh, it's me wishing the movie would just sort of stand up on its own merit and not feel right. the need to, to chalk in a bonus. Rather than being you know an excuse we don't need, it's, uh, it's kind of like an additional layer to the movie. It adds... Uh, sort of another dimension, especially when you see it again, mm -hmm. because you can go back through yeah. and you could say, oh, you can kind of think about the backstory. Oh, these are, you know, this is how she learned to do, you know, the painting and the right. piano and all these different well, things. Well, and how often they say she's mature for her age. Yeah. Every time they say that, suddenly there's another dimension to that. And I like that about it. It's, you know, how she picks up signing so fast or why her English is so well spoken, mm -hmm. like they point out. And then her demeanor as well, yeah. her demeanor throughout the movie. Sure. You can watch it again before you know that she's 30 and you see it in a completely different way. And it really gives her the upper hand when, she, uh, when her and Kate start fighting. For me, when I think about that scene where she's in the white chair, Kate yeah. walks in and that's really the one where I feel that balance of power has definitely shifted. Yep. Where there's no longer a question in my mind that she's dominating over Kate. Because Kate comes in and she's reading Kate's diary. Yeah. And then she's reading it from fucking memory. Right. Also, again, huge tribute to that actor that she's, you know, this is now, you know what it sounds like when she's reading lines sure. because she's reading from a diary. Right. Sounds nothing like yep. her in the rest of the film. She's just so natural at everything. But you have that reversal and she has to remind you over and over that she's a child. Sure. Because she's doing it so well at that point that you've forgotten. But uh, she says to her, you know, what are you going to do? Hit me? Yeah. And suddenly, age gives her this kind of tactical advantage. Sure. So there's the colloquial phrase, youth is wasted on the young. Right. And this shows the dark side of that idiom. <laughs> right. Because right. the phrase is meant to mean, oh, by the time you're old enough to understand the world, you're too old to fully be able to enjoy it. Because when you're young, you're a kid and you're full of life and you have all this energy. Right. What if you knew all the bad shit you can do? Right. <laughs> and right. you knew that you were too young for any consequences. They took something that could have been a disability for them and they've, uh, they've basically seized hold of it yeah. in a way that's become, you know, their most powerful weapon. Well, it's because it's okay to be different. Because it's okay to be different. I'm glad you took that out of the film. Insidious is a movie by James Wan, who is a director we've talked about a little bit on the show we before. We have. He's also a director um, of the Splat Pack, notable for uh, one of our Paloozas. Yeah, which one was that? The Saw Palooza. Oh, yeah, it was him and the writer, right? And right. a couple of the, the ones out. following that. Um, right. And then yeah. the other film that he did in the early 2Ks was um, the puppet movie, Dead Silence. Yeah, so if you'll remember back to Saw, we talked a little bit about how he kind of left Saw to do right, exactly. Dead Silence and to do Insidious mm -hmm. and uh, work with that writer on a couple different projects. Sure. And this he's was still, one of those projects. He's still massive in the horror community. Him mm -hmm. and uh, Oren Pelly are um, the, um, Oren Pelly being the Paranormal Activity guy, yeah. are two huge horror producers. The, the two of them together are who uh, produced Lords of Salem. And they did, um, Oren Pelly produced The River, which was directed by the director from Orphan. I mean, those two guys awesome. are um, fantastically hardworking within the horror community. Even though James Wan, particularly with Dead Silence, a little bit with Insidious, is a little ghosty for a double feature. Yeah, he is ghosty. Yeah, but we don't get a, an opportunity to make ghost cold jokes very often. Right. So it's always good to have one of these movies in here once in a while. I almost feel bad pairing anything up against Orphan because of the force that it is. But Insidious... Uh, I think I mean, Insidious opens with just as much of a punch as Orphan. Well, when I watch Insidious, I choose to embrace a lot of the crazy stuff it does. Sure, that's uh, you have to. Because I think that's what makes it stand out as a film. You have to love that stuff about it. Otherwise, it would just be another Splat Pack film. Right. And uh, the way that it stands out is by bringing in this sort of goofy sideshow absurdism yeah that the other films you know it, it's set in a reality less real maybe than well, the other other movies it's so reminiscent of 
old 1940s hammer horror. Oh, God, I was just going to um, say that. It's, you're... it's this, you're right. I mean, Sideshow, like, it's it's vaudevillian, sure. and it's over the top. The difference is you have Patrick Wilson, who's a heavy actor. Right. He's never going to be your Basil Rathbone <laughs> or your uh, Peter Cushing, sure. where he comes in and speaks in odd verse, yeah. even though his lines are prose, sure. and steals the scene by almost being Shakespearean in his yeah. grandiosity. Patrick Wilson is the low player in yeah. any film, so you need another actor, and that's where you get Lin Shay. Sure. Lin Shay, I think, was probably in some Hammer Horror films. Sure. Um, <laughs> sure. Lin Shay might be the Bella Lugosi, where Patrick Wilson is more the Vincent Price. Dead is that kind of what's going yeah. on here? Yeah. I don't know how Peter Lorre fits into this equation yet, but we'll figure it out. Sleeping child. Wasted, Peter Lorre. Your life wasted. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, look at the opening credits. Yeah. Right? This D- isn't yeah, well, just, exactly. That's, yes. This isn't something we're making up to find the, the yeah. place that Insidious fits no, it, into it this gives plot it pack. To you. It's black and white, high contrast titles, and the fucking music is the oh, most yeah. hammer horror it's, of it's, anything. But, oh my god, that music. It's so, the most characteristic part of the film yeah, for me. Yeah. You know, it's one of the things that drives into the tension, mm. but it's also just so uh, boldly over the top yeah. that you can't even... You can't even, it's, I feel like I'm offending it to call it over the top yeah. because it's pitch perfect for what needs to it be It reminds here. me so much of, do you remember um, Drag Me to Hell? Yeah. It's the same tongue in cheek, only a little bit darker. Yeah. It's but, the same tongue in cheek with less uh, elbow nudging. Hey, this is tongue in cheek. Sure. You know well, fewer I mean? speaking goats. That's probably what it is too. It's the only thing during the beginning half of the movie that separates it from something like uh, Ty West's um, The House of the Devil. Yeah. You know, you have a, a an opening, the whole first act that would be, even some beyond that, I guess, that would just be paced old school. I mean, when I say old school, I, I mean Hitchcock old right. school. Old school is a meaningless phrase. Yeah. We just throw around all the time. Um, the, the kind of Hitchcock era stuff yeah. that's all about tension but the music keeps coming in and going, no, 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 I've seen the end of the film. It's, this is what we're doing like the here. the Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. With more banging on the inside of the piano yeah. than the outside. Knowing that the music can be that powerful, though, makes the tension even greater it's in true. the beginning. Because at any moment, these silent scenes could turn into, you know, letting a monkey loose inside of your piano. Yeah. That's, it really could just be the, the shrill sounds the human ear does not want to hear. That might get unleashed at any time. Yeah. Well, and, and with... I'm scared of that. And with the juxtaposition of silence and great volume, yeah. Insidious has remastered something that I thought I had completely Remastered. I'm excited. In what is horror. it? The jump shot. Oh, yeah. The fucking scaring the shit out of you when sure. you know it's coming. Yeah. Because we're jaded. Yeah. Not just me and you. Every member of Podmanity is fucking jaded. Yeah. And on top of that, everybody they know is sure. jaded. At this point, we've not only covered a bunch of horror films, but hopefully accomplished our goal of convincing people who don't like horror films to watch them anyways. Yeah. Uh, me? Yeah. But you're right. That scare shot that we used to talk so much about, where not only does it, uh, you know, we see it and it doesn't have an effect, I don't even know that I see it in movies yeah. anymore. You can tell when there's a bad one because you see it coming and then it happens and everyone around you goes, Ugh! Yeah, right. and you, you go, really? It. That got you? But instead, I do that. I yeah, go, huh. So do I. Yeah. I mean, it's scary. It's Insidious is amazing in its ability to scare the fuck out of you just Cheaply. using that yeah. string mm-hmm. orchestra and something and walking thing across in the, back the frame. Of the, yep. Yeah. Uh, well, it, they, they do it in the way that, you know, it's obscured in shadows in the background. You're going around a corner and it's revealed to you. It shows up in a mirror. Actually, I don't think they pulled the mirror one, but it is a lot of those cheap shots. Yeah. Of, I mean, sometimes it's more clever twists on that. Sure. I don't want to say it's just cheap shots because that, you know, that sounds mean. Sure. They do that great one where he's... Uh, he's walking outside the window. Yeah, I was just thinking of that. Yeah, and then he's inside. Yeah. So you expect him to maybe, you know, enter. It's it's not that uh, scare shot at the end of the movie where something rushes towards the camera, sure. uh, Japanese horror style. Uh-huh. Instead, it's just a uh, thing is wandering around and you expect that it's outside maybe coming in and then one time it walks Starting back inside. from the side of the frame and it's inside there's also a lot of uh the the camera stuff that kind of goes with that the sliding around the corner of a door mm-hmm. what's going to be there when we look inside 
the um you know the last exorcism crazy stuff and the right. wall kind of shot that they play with well a lot of a lot of what i notice with the camera is that it's never outside how do you mean always claustrophobic when there's people in the frame oh sure well the they have the time... great establishing shots right though, i was those, just those... gonna say you see the house yeah those um, wide angle kind of 360 right. but like they're doing mtv cribs yeah yeah on the Dead outside on. of the, the haunted on. house yeah did you notice when it panned up when she heard the creepy voice on sure. the baby monitor it followed the banister absolutely of the underside of the the second floor absolutely that curve and then spiraled to look at the light Yep. It follows the house because, and this is weird because it's misleading in a way that you wouldn't expect until you get there. Mm -hmm. And tell me if you felt this way. But when they move into the next house, it kind of stops dealing with the home. Yeah. And starts just dealing with, because uh, you see the little kid. Yeah. Great. Well, the, because... the camera wants you to know that it was a haunted house. Yeah, it's exactly. trying to convince you of exactly. it too. Exactly. The camera is showing you the the parts of the house that are a little avant-garde and the parts that smoothly curve yeah. and sneak yep. into places and then you get to the nice suburban house and then there's a little kid dancing yeah to, right it's totally different that's when that's why i fucking love it and i know it's not even that big of a reveal but because lynn shade delivers it and because it's something that i'd never seen before in film it's not the house that's haunted. Right. <laughs> it's your son. Your kid is haunted. I love yeah, that. I love that your son is haunted. Well, because it immediately begs the question. If your son was haunted and you didn't believe in ghosts, but all these horrible things were happening, would you just leave him on the side of the road? Yeah. How do you deal with that? Well, it's his body, right? There's still hope for him. Uh, she's helping mix that. Really, it's a variety of nonsense that people believe into a mythos. Sure. They're talking about uh, he's been astral projected too far, and right. now his body is sought out for by ghosts, and he's in a, another dimension that's also limbo or the underworld or something. You're going to have to uh, wide-angle yourself into another plane of existence yep. in order to get his soul back. You know, it's weird to go back to the camera stuff really quick. Yeah. Really, the entirety of the old house stuff, and a lot of the stuff even... Not so much when they get to the other dimension thing, although that's it's hard to tell in there. A lot of it's wide, uh, wide angle lens shots, but it's also, you know, wide shots themselves. These faraway shots from uh, from the shadows kind of peering into the light. That's how they make that house kind of feel creepy and haunted. They show you how big it is and they keep you in the shadowy parts. You're not looking into the shadows so much as looking at the vulnerable character with his tiny flashlight sure. you know, way on the other side of the room, the camera is also pitched at kind of an unusual angle. So you have the frame tilted to the side and then the camera leaning awkwardly a little bit up or a little bit at an angle itself, uh, unusually low. Even in the scene where they're looking up the stairs, you know, the camera's kind of at that extremely low angle right. looking up. Just trying to make the house seem that much bigger, make her seem that much further down when she's down there with that baby monitor. Yeah. That's an interesting thing, too. The baby monitor, they have this old haunted house, and rather than just using the conventions of this you know, old fucking house, they have the modern technology that's being used to uh, you know, frighten them, too. Mm -hmm. It's the sounds coming out of the baby monitor, uh, giving us a little bit of that... Um, I think it's called EVP or something, electronic voice phenomenon oh, or whatever. The, the white again, noise. yeah, when people think this nonsense is yeah. real. Uh, what was that thing Rebecca Watson used to say? That is total bullshit. That's the one. People, this does not actually <laughs> exist. Ghost hunters in this movie. This does not actually exist. Okay, so there's two major playing points I want to talk about. With oh, there's another thing I forgot about okay. too. Uh, well, sorry, just briefly, the security alarm. Another thing oh, yeah. that's used to scare the crap out of them. Oh, yeah. Modern piece of technology. Yeah. No, sorry. You were going to talk about the ghost I hunters. I want to talk about the ghost hunters. Don't ever let me cut you off from talking about ghost hunters because again. Because I have one great thing to say about them. Yeah. And two things that I don't like about the ghost hunters. And it has nothing to do with the fact that they're hunting ghosts. Surprise, surprise. So Lin Shay. Poltergeist. <laughs> so oh, sorry. Lin Shay is fucking incredible. Uh -huh. And not only as Lin Shay and as this, um, she's probably in her 60s and I have a huge crush on her. She's great. Um, she really is. She's incredible in that I feel like her understanding of the world outside of Ghost Hunters, of your and my and Patrick Wilson's world, is so apropos. She's the first one when he says, this is bullshit. She's like, I should go. 
Yeah. I know what this is like. I understand. Well, I she's kind of here. jaded and just there to pay the bills the thing, usually, but she also has secret real ghost the powers. The thing that she says, I'm going to take your invitation of me here as acceptance of my reading. Yeah. She sits down and says, I'm not sure I should tell you this, but I'm going to tell you. She says, it may conflict with a medical decision, Sure, but I'm going to take the fact that you asked me to come here as acceptance that you want my, hand quotes, professional opinion. Sure. As much as she's still pulling their fucking chain in a normal world, yeah. the amount of human decency it takes sure. to go... Don't take me seriously unless <laughs> right. you really want to believe right. me. That's something that I've never seen. Well, she's treating it the way that, you know, uh, a lot of times conversations about religion or whatever sure. happen in the real world, where you know, in the opposite direction, where you kind of go, listen, I know you believe in all that Christian mumbo jumbo, sure. but I have a scientific opinion. And if you want it, I'll give it to you. Yeah. She's kind of doing the opposite thing yeah. here. And of um, course, you know, they, they ask for it and yeah. they wind up in other world. And they get it. The f What's it called? Further. The, uh, the, the further. further, yeah. Um, With the living statues yeah. and the... Uh, can we talk about the descent into the further? Uh, before that, I want to talk oh, about your other what thing. I don't like. Sure. And then we can just descend as far as we want to because this is a great jumping off point for a descent. Comic relief in film. Oh, yeah. The basic idea of comic relief, everybody's fucking aware of it because we're all over the age of 12 uh -huh. is where you have Chris Rock in your movie or uh, Chris Tucker is a better example Great. and everybody's serious and then cut to Chris Tucker for one liner because the levity has been lost in the scene. <laughs> sure. sure. Um, it was a technique probably developed, I would say probably honed in the eighties um, when you were trying to garner a teen audience. You know, slashers have it in space. Sure. This is different than the straight man yeah. dynamic. Um, which I, I believe we've gotten emails from people under the age of 12 about the straight man dynamic. <laughs> so we're wrong even about that. So in this film, the tension, it's terrifying. You don't understand what's going on. <laughs> you hate that it's happening. Yeah, yeah and you, you don't like it at all. And you want some kind of resolution. Yep. Then you bring in two dopey fucking ghost hunter scientists yeah. who are arguing about equipment, and one's got a bigger light than the other, and sure. my drawings are more important than your computer. And they're the guys you're going to get answers from. <laughs> I, mean, I just <laughs> right? don't understand. Yeah, they come in, and they're buffoons. And yeah. they're, you know, the reason I like them coming in as buffoons is because Lynn's character then gets to mock them. Sure. And, you know, make herself not just the usual ghost hunter to to kind of point at right. them and go the people doing the poltergeist shit uh they're crazy but i'm the real deal that's actually a legitimate point you know and they're can, using modified toys i can see and that, i'm using though. spiritual powers I, I think that that's probably what it is is to separate lynn shay from faulty wiring from yeah well they come in and patrick wilson's eyebrow goes up yeah and right. he gives a side glance to his wife and sure. she's forced to even go eh yeah, sorry about these guys. But then Lynn Shea comes in, and you're you're saying to yourself, okay, Patrick Wilson, I understand that you're a hardliner, but, I mean, at least she's not these guys. Yeah, it's a way for the film to put us a little bit more on her side right away. So let's go a little further. Uh, movie starts, and we just have some people moving into a home, right? And then uh, it turns out their home is haunted. Whoa, whoa, little crazy home is haunted. And then, you know, they have this haunted home that's... I mean, you got to bring in ghost hunters because that's what you do in a haunted house. Then ghost hunters aren't fucking ridiculous enough. So then we have to go into the further, which is literally just how can we it's how can we take this further? Yeah, right? it's that's what it becomes. That's exactly what's happening. Let's push it's, it. This isn't fucking absurd enough. How do we go even more in that direction? How do we take it beyond its logical sure. conclusion? Well, This is the step beyond the exorcism. Yeah, we've that's had exactly the exorcism. It. It's, I mean, it's a seance with a gas mask. Sure, but that is the most fucked up, weird seance gas sure, mask I've sure. seen, short of a talking goat. Yeah, and this is how they push it. This is James Wan proving that he is a horror guy and that he can take it to a level it hasn't been to before, even at the risk of his own film. Yeah, suddenly we get into this steampunk kind of weird it, uh, gas mask, man. It's yeah. You know, we were talking on the, uh, what was that episode? It was Willow and Mirror Mask uh, about Neil Gaiman and Sandman stuff. Yeah. And that was a, a thing in Sandman, I think I was trying to describe the weird helmet thing he has, which just looks like a gas mask. You're putting, a, I, maybe this is a thing. You put a gas mask in a world where it doesn't belong, 
and it freaks everybody the fuck out. Right. Yeah, so she's wearing it, and it's creepy, and they have the weird seance scene, and then they go into the other world, and there's a fucking living statues. Living statues are about as far as you go on the terrifying scale before you just get into the oh, come on scale, yeah. before everything just becomes... Um, I mean, I keep going back to the word absurdism, but I don't know how else to address it than that. You know, that's no, really what it is. true. So you're right. He takes those risks. He uh, He's not always going for creepy. You know, when they're not going for creepy, they go for vaudeville. Sure. They well, go for let's let's create something for people to remember. Right. They play 20s music. They bring the, yeah. the doll theme back, which I think is a sure. huge thing with James Wan. Yeah, right. Um, I think there's some horrible thing. You know, <laughs> you, know you know, the thing where they say where on the doll did he touch <laughs> sure. you? No, it's I where think, on the doll did Darth Maul touch you. Oh, yeah, that's true. Darth Maul. So there's a scene in this where they reenact the Clint Howard um, Rob Zombie commercial, but with <laughs> this red <laughs> face so good, Darth Maul. That's so good, by the way. Yeah. Um, have you seen the uh, the one with... Uh, of course I have. Okay, good. We should link somewhere on the site to all the Rob Zombie commercials. They should be their own Killapalooza. Yeah, the Dan Roebuck one was hilarious. Anyways. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's where uh, the kid is chained up. It's where Dalton has been chained. Right, right. And it's it's completely separate from everything we've seen in the film. Everything's yellow, and it's loud, and there's clanking. And there's more dancing. Yeah, and there's a demon listening to... I can't think of the song now, because all I can think of is the glory of love. Sure. Um, well, so this very same Tiptoe demon... through the tulips. Oh, there it is. <laughs> This, uh, I didn't remember either. This demon was scary earlier in the movie and now is it's crazy, horrifying. is zany. <laughs> yeah, horrifying. it is horrifying though. Yeah. Early in the, with the, with the pointing yeah, and then sure. the half face. Yeah, you're scared of when you're going to see him. And as you start to see him, you think, wow, I was not ready for this at all. And again, just surprising you going in a completely different direction. Uh, you don't understand anything about this world. It's something different than you imagined. That's what makes it memorable to me. Yeah. That's what makes it stand out is that it goes off the rails at the end and they do a, a circus fucking sideshow. All right. So uh, we have a website uh, that's doublefeatureshow.com. We have an email address, which is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. You can email us, I don't know, something about what was the thing I made fun of 12 year olds. If you're under 12 and you listen to our show, so write an Michael email. an angry email and I will send it to him. Be nice to me in the email though, because I have to read it first. <laughs> what are we doing next time on the show? Next time on the show, we are doing uh, the artist and Barton Fink. Still gonna be weird. Okay. Well, I I mean, is there anything more to say other than watch more fucking film? And goodbye.